Shalom family. I'm not too good with this. I'm a bit rusty, but uh, hopefully certain uh, winged person upstairs of the angelic persuasion caught some tips and listened and saw how to do this. And uh, yeah, can maybe get that thing going. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Right, so Rosh Hashanah, let's just talk through a few things on Rosh Hashanah. I was going to make a nice little presentation for you, but I thought, you know what, let's just chat through it and discuss some things. This might be a bit longer than I usually make, so bear with me. The Jews are starting to celebrate Rosh Hashanah with trumpet blows as of sunset today, the 15th, and they will run us through for two days. So the first thing is, as I mentioned in the short, the four festivals, the three that Jesus has not fulfilled yet, are all about the return of the king. And blowing of the trumpet is an expectation of God showing up. Now we know God's with us all the time, but they mean God showing up. Like God showed up on the mountain and the top was burnt from his presence and there was thunder and lightning. They mean showing up like when Yeshua comes back at the end of the seven years and he puts his holy feet on the Mount of Olives. It splits apart with an earthquake and creates a valley all the way to the east gate through which he can walk and enter as conquering king. That kind of arrival of God, that is what they connotate with the sound of the shofar or the ram's horn. So again, 15th to the 17th for the Jews that they're going to be celebrating Rosh Hashanah and their civil new year. According to the calculations of Nisan correctly, because Nisan sets the entire calendar of the Jews up for the entire year again. And, and it's built on the agricultural cycles. It has to happen. The barley has to be right. There's a whole bunch of things and I can go into that in a separate video. We have covered it before this year. They claimed to have sighted the moon before the moon was literally sighted. And using stellarium and things like that, Christian believers, watchmen and watchwomen could calculate that they were actually out with a few days. And those few days, if you go on when the moon was actually visible in Jerusalem, according to the sky map, for it to be declared Nisan 1, then if you calculate from there forward, as per the word of God, then the 18th to the 20th of September is actually Rosh Hashanah. But again, it's neither here nor there. It is the time of Rosh Hashanah that is upon us. There's others that still believe that they're out even further. But I'm going to work on 18th to the 20th. And my reason for that is this. The enemy likes to mock God. He likes to take what belongs to God. That's why he's after you all the time. He likes to make a mockery of anything that is holy and special to God. That is why he defiles everything that is supposed to be pure. And he likes to take special dates that belong to God and show them up in God's face. Why do you think he's aiming for 2030? Because he knows his 2000 years is up. He knows this. And why do you think he's trying to confuse the Hebrew calendar completely and that they're missing 210 years because he doesn't want them to know what the time is. So he's, he's not dumb. He's calculating and he's evil and spiteful and he's trying to just be a loser for and he's doing a great job at that. So for the world to be setting up this conference at the 18th to the 20th, right, the SDG UN summit will be taking place. They'll be discussing their sustainable goals. They'll be recommitting and strengthening that covenant they've made for the next seven year period to 2030. They're discussing the Israeli-Palestinian problem on the sidelines that can very easily be shifted into the main line. And then they can involve both parties and draw up that deal. The Saudis play a big part in this thing that's going forward. So... The Hashemite kingdom, we can talk about that later as well. All these things the Antichrist can use to strengthen and confirm that covenant with many. And Why put it on the 18th to the 20th? Because he probably knows that's the right time. So I'm just putting that out there. So on the first day of the seventh month, Tishri, that's now, the Torah commands us to observe the holy day of Yom Teruah, which means 
In Hebrew, proper translation, the day of shouting. Leviticus 23, verse 23 to 25, and Numbers 29, verse 1 to 6. It is the blasting of the horn and shouting. The same way that when they marched around Jericho, they blew the horn and they shouted to God in triumph. Yom Teruah is a day of shouting and the blowing of the horns. It is a day of rest on which work is forbidden. For us, I see that as we will finally come to the point of rest, where our race is run, where everything is finished, it could be, it could be we're approaching that time of rest, where God can just finally say, welcome home, my child, it's done now, you can rest, it's over, finished, klar, in Afrikaans here in South Africa. One of the unique things about Yom Teruah is that the Torah does not say what the purpose of this holy day is. The Torah gives us at least one reason for all the other holy days and two for some of them. But Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, not one. Today, few people remember the biblical name of Yom Teruah and instead it's widely known as Rosh Hashanah which literally means head of the year, and hence also New Year. So they'll celebrate New Year's, they'll say Happy New Year to each other, all those things, they'll have honey and apples, the sweetness of the year ahead that they're celebrating. The transformation of Yom Teruah, the day of shouting, into Rosh Hashanah, the New Year's, is the result of pagan Babylonian influence on God's nation. Unfortunately, it's like that. We see that same influence in Christianity with all sorts of pagan rituals and feasts that have been brought in that we celebrate in Christianity that are very, very wrong. But again, different video, different time. This influence is what led to this. It is bizarre to celebrate Yom Teruah as New Year's. While the rabbis proclaimed Yom Teruah to be New Year's, they still recognize that the first day of the first month in the Torah was, as the name implied, also a new year's. They could hardly deny this based on Exodus 12 verse 2, which says, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It is the first of the months of the year. How much more clearer should Yahweh be? And that's Nisan in the beginning of the year. That is actual. Around April, May, that is their first month. That is their New Year's. But under Babylonian exile, the Babylonians had two New Year's. And the other one fell at exactly the same time as Rosh Hashanah. So Yom Teruah became Rosh Hashanah and it became their civil New Year. So now they have a civil New Year and they have an agricultural New Year. That's the way they reconcile themselves. What they should actually be saying is, we have a Babylonian false New Year and we have God's New Year. But they're not even attributing the other one to God. They're attributing that to the agricultural New Year. It's ridiculous. You have one New Year, Israel. It is in the beginning in Nisan. And even Nisan, the name is wrong. You should be calling it the first month. God names these months of the Jews the first month the second month, the third month. We've covered this in a video. It's beautiful. I like the names. That is the way it's supposed to be. But again, Babylonian influence and false influence on these kind of things have led to this. The Feast of Sukkot, booths, booths and uh, known to us mostly in English as tabernacles, takes place exactly two weeks after Yom Teruah. It is referred to in one verse as the going out of the year. Exodus 23, 16. So God is telling them, in the sun, it is the first of the month, the very first. This is your new year. He's making it as clear as possible. This is the beginning of months. And then two weeks after Yom Teruah, he's saying, this is the going out of the year, the end, the finish. Do you people understand me? Yes, Lord, we're going to call this one other new year. You wonder sometimes, you know, how does God just persist with us? I would have called it a day long ago, but, you know, God loves us more than my brain can understand. And he's long suffering with us and his grace is more than we can understand. 
The Jews also know Yom Teruah by many other traditional names, pointing to their understanding of this feast throughout the last few thousand years. And the names I'm going to give you now, and a lot of them are going to make your eyes pop and go, wow, now if they just understood Yeshua or had him as Messiah, this would mean so much more to them. It is known and seen as the anniversary of Adam and Eve, right? So thinking back to the creation of man, and again, looking at where we are on the timeline, we're reaching the end of the, the time of mankind, from where we started to where we end. It would be a good place to end on Yom Teruah. The day of the awakening blasts, also understood by them as the resurrection of the dead. Which makes sense because they're blowing this shofar a hundred times, some of them a hundred and ten times, some of them a hundred and thirty times, depending on the type of Jew and the sect that they're a part of. So the awakening blast that awakes the dead and is tied to the resurrection of the dead. How amazing is that? Because we know that the dead in Christ will rise first at that blast. And then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the air forever to be with the Lord. So, wow, that, that is one of the names that they have for Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah. The coronation of the king. We will be throwing our crowns at his feet shortly. And, and he will be coronated before us. He is our king. And the king has just been in the field. Is the law. The king is in the field. And now the coronation of the king. Proclaiming him king of kings and lord of all. God above everything. The hidden day. Hey. How nicely does that fit in with the rapture. The moon had to be sighted precisely. So it is the hidden day because they were never sure where it was going to fall. The same way they were supposed to start counting in the sand. Now this is my favorite. And this is from Jews that don't believe in Jesus, right? The feast of no man knows the day or the hour. Because the feast runs over two days and it's reliant on the sighting of the moon. So you can never say we're celebrating Rosh Hashanah on the 15th and 16th. Because it might be the 18th and 19th. Case in point this year. And it might not be this. It might be that. We're not sure exactly what time it's going to happen. We have to look at Jerusalem. So it's actually the feast of no man knows the day or hour. So when Jesus says no man knows the day or hour. Does his disciples not immediately know because they are culturally relevant to that time and to the practices? Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah, obviously, because no one knows the day or hour. He must be talking about Yom Teruah and the blasting of the trumpets because he's mentioning a trumpet. You see how incredible this is. I'm not saying it has to be. I'm saying there's a lot of reasons why it could be. And it's incredible. It's known as the opening of the gates of heaven. Heaven's gates have opened. Because they're heading into a period of intense reflection and repentance. Running all the way to the day of atonement. And they believe the books of life in heaven are opened. And God is looking at everything. And they're repenting and preparing themselves to come before God on the day of atonement. The heavenly gates are open. We believe the doors are open and God is stepping through that door to come and collect his bride shortly. It is also known to them as wedding of Messiah. They're still waiting for their Messiah. Our Messiah is known. We know our Messiah. Our Messiah reigns. He's died for us. He's risen again. He lives forevermore and he's coming to fetch his bride and take us to where he has prepared a place for us. To a great wedding in the sky where we will celebrate with him for seven days slash years while he deals with Israel for the last time on earth. Then they also know it is the time of Jacob's trouble. How relevant is that to the final week that lies at the door right now? The time of Jacob's trouble. It is here and they know this feast is that. And they're thinking about Jacob's trouble and what lies ahead and everything that's part of that process. So if you look at Revelations 4 verse 1, there's a door standing open, right? We've seen one of their names as the heavenly doors are opened. A trumpet speaking, come up 
hear. Come. Hinaini, Yeshua. Here I am. Take me. Take me. We're waiting. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 16 to 18. He talks about descending with a shout, a trumpet, the dead rising, us being caught up. In 1 Corinthians 15 51, it's talking about a mystery, us being changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. The last trumpet. The last trump is not a vague reference. It is a very specific reference. According to 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51 to 52, the rapture will happen at the last trumpet trump this is very clear and it will come to pass just as scripture said that it will now the debate and the discussion around this is when is this last trump and what last trump is he referring to exactly the last trump that is part of the rapture description in the apostle paul's first letter to the church in corinth is actually a clear reference to the 100th trumpet blast of the feast of trumpets the 100th trump is the last trump. The other belief is that it could be the very last trump at the end of Feast of Tabernacles. But the known last trump would be the 100th on Yom Teruah. This is because 100 trumpet blasts are blown during the Feast of Trumpets over the next 48 hour period. Moreover, there are three different kinds of trumpet blasts and they have different names and descriptions associated with them. The last trump also has a special name. So the seventh trumpet of Revelation, if you look into the book of Revelation 11 verse 15 to 19, is a trumpet of judgment. If you look at the second half of the verse 19, when the seventh trumpet is blown, it says, And there came flashes of lightning rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake, and a severe hailstorm. Revelation eleven nineteen b So it's judgment related, that trumpet, seventh. The last trump of the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, on the other hand, is a trumpet of hope and redemption. We await our blessed hope, for our Redeemer comes to collect us. When some hear or read the phrase, the last Trump, they immediately assume it's somewhere in the middle or at the end of the tribulation. So mid-trib, post-trib, all those arguments. When in fact, the last trump occurs every year, every single year, when the Feast of Trumpets is celebrated. The phrase, the last trump, is a Jewish idiom, which represents a specific moment during the Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. They refer to that moment as the last trump. It is a Jewish thing. So the trumpet blasts. Let's just talk about that for a second. There's three of them. The tekiah. And I'm not going to try. I'm not that good. The tekiah is a long single blast. It has straight, plain, smooth, continuous note. And it symbolizes an expression of joy and contentment. Tekiah. The next one is called the Shevarim. Shevarim is three short blasts, a combination of three broken notes to symbolize weeping. And then you get the Trua, an extremely short blast, which is a combination of nine staccato notes in a quick succession, like that. This symbolizes trepidation, sorrow, and sobbing. So those are their three, Tekiah, Shevarim, Trua, and they will mix them up too, the way they play them throughout Feast of Trumpets. Now, the Tekiah Gedola, this is the last trump, that is its name, Tekiah Gedola, the last trump. Now, if you break down Gedola, Hagadol means big, so it is the big Blast. It literally is their meaning for the last trump, Tekia Gadola. This one symbolizes the hope of redemption. It is a long final note. 
in the 100 blasts, the first of three categories are combined back and forth until they have a total of 99 sounds. Then, at the very end, comes the 100th, the Takiya Gedola, a long, sustained note. It's the one we're waiting to hear from heaven. As long as the trumpeter has breath to hold it, this is known as the last trump, Takiya Gedola. That is the very last one. As long as you have breath, that is how long this trump is. It becomes significant when the messianic implications of this festival are discussed. So you, you blow that trumpet and you blow and blow. It's loud and it tapers off as the person loses his breath and his ability until it just disappears. But it is a long, long call to Kia Gadola, the last trump. How long is an angel's breath? How long can he blow that trumpet? How long will that final trump blast sound when we eventually hear it from heaven? Now, this is the important connection. The last trump which appears in verses describing the rapture, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 52, is a direct reference to the final trumpet blast blown at the end of Yom Teruah, the feast which occurs each year and is one that Jesus still needs to fulfill. With that being said, of course, no one knows the day or hour. We hear this a lot from our scoffers and mockers, and everyone keeps reminding us about this because they're too lazy to look at any of the other commands that says, you are of the day, not of the night, that this day should overtake you. Watch the seasons that you may know the day or hour. Know the time of your visitation, unlike the hypocrites that never knew the time of their visitation when Jesus came the first time. Again, I don't want to get off topic, but I can talk about that for ages. The day that no man knows is a Jewish idiom referring to Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. In other words, these idioms, the last trump and the day that no man knows, are both associated with Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah. In Yeshua's first coming... He was slain on Pesach, buried on unleavened bread. He rose from the dead on first fruits of the barley harvest. Fifty days later at Shavuot, Pentecost, the eschatological last day's congregation received Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, empowering them to witness as the kingdom of heaven came down to dwell in men's hearts. The four festivals, likewise, are appointments, murdim, for Yeshua's second coming, each teaching on different aspects of his coming and the messianic kingdom on earth. All of them he will still fulfill. So yes, there is an argument that, and again, I'm saying this, the rapture is imminent, can happen at any second, at any time. He doesn't need to fulfill it on Yom Teruah or any other feast. He can do it any time. He did the first bunch of feasts. He can do all of the last ones when he comes again at the end of the seven years. Nothing is too hard for him. He will fulfill them all the way he is meant to. But could the rapture be part of that fulfillment on Yom Teruah? Absolutely. Why not? Who's going to tell Jesus what he can or can't do when it makes so much sense that he could? But if he doesn't, he could do it at any other moment. Because there's nothing left that's holding back him collecting his bride. Except Yahweh saying, my son, go fetch her. So there are 10 days of awe that I want to touch on as well. Between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Now they include those two feasts. So if you start on Tishri 1, Rosh Hashanah, day 1 and day 2. Those two days of Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, whatever you want to call it, that's them. Right Then there are seven days of reflection and repentance as they're building up to Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Seven days, very serious days that they're going to work through. That they know God's judgment is pending, the books of life are open, everything has been looked at, God is watching and dealing with them. Seven days. Then they go straight into the tenth day, which is Yom Kippur, where they come before God. Now the interesting thing with this is, if you take this and you step back, the way God likes to show things as a mirror or a type, 
two days, Rosh Hashanah. You'd say the last two years we've been prepping and preparing and blowing trumpets and warning the world and everything that the Lord is coming and the rapture is at the door and everything. Boom! We rapture now. 2023. We're going straight into seven days, years of Daniel's 70th week where he deals with Israel. They seek repentance. They call on him. Elijah and Moses are preaching. 144,000 Jews have been called and they're ministering. Angels are flying across the heavens preaching the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. Judgment is falling. Seven days of that. And boom, that leaves you the last one where he returns with his bride, all of us, on the 10th day, Yom Kippur. And they all look upon him whom they pierced. Every eye will see him, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He comes back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So these 10 days is perfectly mapped out for what lies ahead with this week of Daniel that's about to start. Two days, seven days of reflection. We have seven days upstairs with God in a wedding feast. Seven years. And then the return. Day of Atonement. And then after that, he's got one feast left. Which one is that? Sukkot. Tabernacles. And he tabernacles with mankind physically here on earth for a thousand years. A whole day of rest. It's amazing. It's, it's, it's exciting. The way everything is a type, a picture, just a vision of what's lying ahead. It, it's incredible. And we get to see this approaching and happening and laid out. And the Holy Spirit's revealing all these things to us. The books are unlocked. Everything is now revealed because we're in that final generation. Ha'akaron, the last generation. We see all these things and then we leave in the rapture and we get to come back with him and see the whole story end properly. How blessed are we? Jesus also said there would be signs in the sun, moon and stars before his return. Luke 21, 25. And uh, go check out the video I did where I talk about what T.W. Tram explained on the Nishimura comment, comet and all those things. And I will do another video where I'll discuss the great sign which happens to be happening right now, right above our heads, with Rosh Hashanah slash Yom Teruah slash Feast of Trumpets, all at the same time. So it's an exciting time. I'm not going to say Happy New Year to the Jews because I prefer to stick with what God says. And God says the first of the months is way back in the beginning of the year when we celebrated the first time when people called us April Fools. When God says this is your first month. But so many exciting, amazing things. With Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Teruah, the day of shouting that is going to take place. And the enemy is excited because his plans are all coming together and everything. And he knows his time is short. We're excited because we see his plans clearly. And we see that the Lord is coming to fetch us. We see the signs in the heavens. We see what's happening in the world. The wars, the rumors of wars, fires in half the world, floods in the other half of the world, earthquakes, volcanoes waking up, the absolute degenerate population around us, the evil running rampant, the darkness and chaos everywhere. We see revivals and outpourings of Ruach HaKodesh in people's lives. We see boldness taking root and people speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ into a dark world. We see the Lord moving because his heart is compassionate for the lost and there might still be that one person. You know who is going to be that last person before the rapture? I want to meet that person. I want to go up to them, shake their hand, give them a big hug and say, brother or sister, whichever one it's going to be, we were all <laughs> rooting for you so that we could get off earth and get to God. We were just waiting for God to capture your soul and bring you home. You were that lost child. Come, come, let's go celebrate with Jesus. We've got a lot to talk about. And we are that close, people. Hang in there. Stay faithful, stay strong, shine your light, speak the truth, 
preach the word, preach it in season and out of season, regardless of scoffers and mockers and anything. Because every single one of you is called by God for the Great Commission. For a time such as this, God never calls the qualified. He qualifies the called. God will assist you. Let us be about our master's work. God bless. Shalom.